Imagine you're a delivery driver and you get a call from the boss. Go to this address, make a pickup, drop it off. Same as always, except you've never heard of the street. In fact, the address doesn't even exist. But the boss said go, so you start driving. There's no package there, but the boss said make a pickup, so you pick it up anyways. It's addressed to a cement mixer. It's a little weird, but you know, the boss is the boss. So you make the drop, and the instant you do, the cement mixer becomes a dump truck full of gravel. The boss calls again, another pickup, same address. So you go back to that non-place and collect a different non package it's addressed to the dump truck so you head on back except after you make the second drop you're standing in front of a tank this is not a riddle this is a metaphor for five characters of c or c plus plus they form a mind-bending syntactic boondoggle that won't just change how you code it'll transform how you think about code ladies gentlemen and cyborgs this is void star lab and this is the void star I don't know if it's the demographic, the algorithm, or just the angry ghost of Susan Wojcicki, because you know YouTube wouldn't just let a former CEO walk out of there. When a single semicolon hits the screen, my viewer retention graph just like ends. This time you gotta trust me, even if you don't program, the Void Star is one of the most fascinating constructs in the entirety of computer science. It's both worthless and practical to a degree that it's almost philosophical. Simply knowing this thing exists can carve weeks off your projects. Let's follow Follow the star into the void after a word from today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. I'm gonna level with you. I love learning, I hate being taught. If you want a free and friendly way to dive into or dive deeper into computer science, this is the best way to finally grasp those wriggly abstract topics that are just hard to listen to. Math, data science, even AI, every lesson is crafted to make the conceptual sensible. Honestly, even calling these lessons is almost unfair. A lot of them are more like mini games, tricky little challenges that build your intuitive understanding as you experiment and play and find your way through. Others are almost like quizzes, but when you get it wrong, you don't get punished. You get a variety of walkthroughs and demos till something finally sticks. The next time you're stumped, Brilliant knows what kind of help you find most helpful. Take this class on artificial neural networks. You could watch a lecture on layers and neurons and activation functions. You could spend hours of setup, copy and pasting code you'd never understand. Or you could mess with this interactive demo and watch a functional neural network actually categorize drawings drawings in real time. If you've got five minutes, you can learn something new on Brilliant.org. Go to Brilliant.org slash Zach Friedman for a free month-long trial and save 20% off an annual plan. Thank you, Brilliant, for sponsoring this video, including the following trip down memory lane, because a void star is something that you follow to get to memory. Let me to explain. Last month, I was invited to the first ever open sauce, William Osmond's Maker Faire VidCon combo in beautiful, surprisingly windy San Francisco. It was awesome. I gave away like four kilos of extraction tiles. I did a panel with some people who actually do know electronics. And finally, I took a Q&A with 18 delightful super fans. Uh, technically 16 delightful super fans and two delightful super parents. One question really caught me by surprise. Why do I call the channel Void Star Lab? In the before times, I was a freelance prototype developer stacking my cheddar as Void Star Lab LLC. When some mysterious, I forget what happened, I went to YouTube to try to find clients, so I kept the name. But why name it Void Star Lab in the first place? It's because a Void Star is an extremely pretentious but surprisingly accurate metaphor for the practice of prototyping. The lab part is because I only have one workshop. That's a stupid line, I don't know why I put it in there. A Void Star is a type of variable in the programming languages C, C++, and possibly C Sharp. I don't remember because last time I used Microsoft's Java fanfic, I was chiefing a jazzy hookah at college. Go Ducks! I'm kidding. Nobody gives a shit about the Ducks. Technically, a Void Star is two types the Void and the Star. Void is a data type, like byte or car, char, how do you pronounce that? Except instead of representing an 8 bit number or a 7 bit number wearing a hat, the kind of data a Void contains is no kind of data. If you're not a programmer, or if you're a Python programmer, same thing. Oh. The ability to make a variable intrinsically meaningless seems itself intrinsically meaningless. Honestly, if you have written a bunch of C, you've used enough voids to wonder if the Python programmers quote-unquote have a point. The void's most common habitat is immediately preceding a function, specifically a function that doesn't return anything. A function or a method is a pre-programmed procedure, a block of code with a name that you can invoke whenever you want. I know a few of you are skulking around the comments going, are you aware that methods and functions are actually actually different? Or 
Are you aware that shut the f*** up? I must also come clean. I do love Python and in fact prefer it over C because it's just better in all respects. Case in point, why most C and C++ functions are void. When you invoke or call a method, it runs the code line by line until it hits the word return. Hey kids, Zach from the future here. Just wanted to point out that the code on screen is for illustration purposes only and very little of it will actually compile. My objective here is to show you the concepts as clearly as possible, not necessarily you know, spoon feed you how to implement them. So before you correct me in the comments, just bear in mind, I did it on purpose. Return just means eject from the function and output a piece of data, like an intern returning with my coffee. The word before the function declares what type of data it will return. I say will because this is mandatory. Whenever I call the intern function, one of two things happens. It either crashes the entire program or comes back carrying one coffee. Not two coffees, not tea, and most importantly, not zero coffees. Yes, all interns' pronouns are it. This means before I sip my pumpkin spice data chino, I have to lift the lid and look inside. If the Starbucks staff is on strike or the intern forgot its wallet, it's not allowed to return empty-handed. It must come back with a fucky wucky coffee. It could be null, and if I try to drink a non-existent coffee, then I will crash. Or it could be a cup of error, and who knows what'll happen if I guzzle that. This makes our lives a little bit miserable, and while that is the purpose of an intern, I'm a very busy cyborg. That's why C and C++ let you change the return type from coffee to void. When a void function returns, nothing comes out. Your function could just shrug and peace out. Zach from the future here again. Realize this part wasn't clear enough. Using a void function here is like having the intern drop the coffee off at your desk if it succeeds. If it fails, it just drops off nothing. You can just go back to your desk and if there's a coffee there, you can always drink it. If there isn't a coffee, that's what you deserve for delegating your stuff to an intern instead of a real person. This lets you write cleaner code with fewer special cases to trip over and fewer potential game-breaking bugs. That way you can put all your focus into preventing that dumb shit intern from crashing the goddamn space-time continuum again. Then there's the star. The asterisk, the splat, the cat's cornhole, you will see stars studying all but the most straightforward programs. The star is like a modifier. You attach it to another type, like a bunny tail, or just let it float there, and it changes the meaning. You can also glue it to the variable's name, like a clown nose, but despite being functionally equivalent, this is widely regarded as a symptom of brain damage. The star means this variable does not contain data. It contains a pointer. It's the address of a location in memory, which does contain data of that star star type. For instance, an integer is a 16-bit number, but an int star is a 64-bit number, at least on a 64-bit operating system. It's the address of a 16-bit number, and by following the pointer called dereferencing, you can visit the integer's house and collect or modify the number. So why pass around a pointer if you could just pass around the data themselves? The simplest is data can get really, really big. If I've got an animated quagsire with millions of polygons, I mean polygons, I would waste tons of time and memory if I had to make a full copy anytime anything wants a look at his widow Shane upon him. Pointers also synchronize related bits of code. If an animator is moving Quag Daddy, a renderer is displaying him, and a physics engine is calculating his hitbox, it makes more sense to have a single canonical quag sire everything can work on together. As long as nothing reads while anything else writes, there's no need to coordinate the changes. The entire team is working off the same scrap of virtual paper. So we have a void, a slot in memory with irrelevant contents. We have a star, the address of a specific slot in memory. I was going to do this like pen pineapple apple pen thing, but I think you people are too old and too young to get it. Point is, void plus star equals a pointer to no type of data. The void star is the most distilled form of pure abstraction, a piece of memory pointing to another piece of memory, completely devoid as it were from any real world context. If you try to dereference it, if you try to visit the address and knock on on its door just straight up fails. It won't even compile. That said, like if you know for a fact that the address contains like an integer or a coffee, you can explicitly tell the compiler to close its eyes and trust you. It's called casting. But on its own, a void star can't tell what kind of data is there. It can't tell you whether there is any data there at all. It can't even tell if that is a place that data could be. 
This makes the void star a pretty apt metaphor for the process of prototyping. When a new idea hits the real world, no one knows what's going to happen, so the prototype's purpose, like a void star, is to get you there before you know what you're getting. I also talk a lot, and an overly complicated way to say nothing was, you know, not entirely I talk a lot. Here's the kicker. A void star does not point to nothing. It can point to things that exist in memory, but don't have a data type, because they aren't data. A function is not data. So a void star can point to a function. If this sounds like truly insufferable rules lawyer bullshit, then you, my friend, have now seen the true face of programming. Take this one, Boolean, did you like, comment, and subscribe yet? This is not a Boolean, because a Boolean is either true or false, and this is a function. Methods live in memory like data, but they are not data. You can't multiply eight times the support my channel on Patreon method. What you can do, besides supporting me for only a few dollars a month, is a assign a function to a void star variable, then call the variable to invoke the function. Pay close attention to how this line is written. If we were calling the method and assigning it to the variable, this would have parentheses. But this variable isn't being assigned the output of the method, it is being assigned the whole enchilada. With void stars, you can dynamically plug in new procedures, even from other people's code, and retroactively change what happens when the method is called. A void star, like a prototype developer, could be or do anything. 3D printing, electronics, software development, you can always call void star lab. I thought that was very clever. You may wonder if blindly plugging and chugging random methods like playing chess with your eyes closed could lead to some weird sh You have no idea, but these five characters cleanly answer so many of the real world's filthiest challenges is often worth trusting your fate to the programmatic equivalent of a back alley doctor who claims he can do eyes. First use, by far the most common, the callback. Suppose you got a method, download file. It downloads files off the internet. This can take a while, so whenever you call this function, your program is gonna freeze until the download finishes and something is returned. So you move this method to a second thread and do both at the same time. Now your download can mosey along in the background while your code continues to interact with the user. But now you're in a pickle. What happens when the download ends? It could succeed, in which case you now have a file to deal with, but your code has moved on, there's nowhere to collect it. Or the download fails, which could mean trying again, it could mean sobbing in fetal position, or under certain circumstances it could mean both. You could copy and paste all these responses into the download thread, but in a real program you are going to be downloading stuff all over the place in all kinds of different contexts. So we create a class called download task with two members, a void star called on success and a void star called on failure. We paste in the same download file method but add a little pizzazz. If the download finishes, we call on success and pass in the download. If the download fails, we call on failure and pass in the error response. We have now created an all-purpose downloader we can use all over the program. If we're displaying an image, we can write a function to put the download on screen and assign that to on success. We can make a method that displays an error icon and assign it to on failure. If we're saving the file, we can just do the file system stuff in on success and maybe pop a dialog box in on failure. If you upgrade that void star to a list of void stars, maybe even a void star star, you could queue up a whole bunch of callbacks and fire them off one by one. If you're feeling really frisky, you could even assign each one a priority and allow critical events to cut in line. So if you think about it, most programs are things doing things in response to other things. You can structure an entire program this way. It's called event-driven architecture. It means that causes don't have to know anything about the effects they fire, so objects can interact on a very deep level, yet stay completely self-contained. You've taken a snarl of interconnected program clumps that bobble data between them like a hot potato, and structured it into discrete causes and effects that trigger a under specific circumstances. The whole thing's pretty slick. The second use for void stars is, I think, the reason they're so obscure, and it's modularity. You might be licking your lips for me to say object-oriented programming, but no. This is what you do when object-oriented programming becomes too clunky. I mean, object-oriented programming is always too clunky, but not everyone is this enlightened. Object-oriented programming, which I'm gonna call OOP from now on, is the practice of bundling data with the methods that affect it into classes that represent real-world 
world objects. It sounds great in theory. As my wife has reminded me I used in a previous episode, the difference between theory and practice is greater in practice than in theory. As the program matures, classes tend to get increasingly overgrown, overly codependent, and just a giant pain in the gigi to modify. OOP is still the industry standard coding practice, but when you want to change what an action does, it's often more sensible to swap out the cause than the effect. This is the Singularitron, my goofy vacuum fluorescent display smartwatch that I built in an earlier video. Link up there. The X Factor is its cartridges, which let you slot in a flashlight, laser, breathalyzer, you get the idea. I had initially hoped to embed each cartridge's code in the module itself, but that is way beyond my kung fu. Instead, I did it object-oriented. I wrote a class for each cartridge containing all its data and all its behavior. When I insert a module, it conjures up a copy of the corresponding cartridge class, and when I press a button, and the firmware runs the same command on whatever cartridge happens to be there. This is by the books. This is industry standard. This was a nightmare. The cartridge classes immediately degenerated into spaghetti hell as nested classes metastasized and key features fractured across dozens of files. When I added more modules for the video, I wasted ages tripping over all that bookkeeping busy work I made for myself. This was also like a bug factory. Instancing and destroying objects opens the door for memory leaks, and since this code deals in hardware, unexpected interactions can bork sensors and deadlock entire chunks of the chip. And without full-featured debugging tools, because this is like a piddly little microcontroller, tracing the flow of code sucked a bag of ducks. Pardon my language. Sure, it let me make multiple instances of the same cartridge class, but I didn't build multiple instances of the same cartridge hardware. Suppose I instead used void stars. Everything a cartridge can do, from flashing a light, to showing a reading to gathering data, it's all a function. No need to instance the class or manage memory, all code and all data are in play at all times. When I snap the flashlight module into slot 2, we just take the flash the light method and assign it to on button 2 press. No super class calls, no null pointers, no bullshit, and most importantly, none of the functionality of the cartridge is wrapped up in the implementation of the button. All the button does is call that void star, and all the cartridge does is assign bits of itself to that void star. You just press button to, it calls void star on button to pressed, and if there's something assigned to it, something happens. There are other things you can do with void stars, like performing pointer arithmetic and allocating memory, but I'll be honest, I am not smart enough to even come up with examples for those. There is a reason I named my company after a flashy way to have zero substance. Thanks again to Brilliant.org for sponsoring everything but that last sentence, and don't forget, head to Brilliant.org slash Zach Friedman to make with the learning for 30 free days, followed by 335 days of 20% off. Please let me know what you thought of this episode. It's a bit far out of my lane, but I'm looking for more ways to keep videos flowing while I work on the really ambitious stuff in the background. It's a bit like multi-threading. That's a callback. If you want to see future videos, bind your callback function to Void Star Lab by hitting subscribe and switching on them notifications. That was a callback callback to callbacks. To support me more tangibly, visit patreon.com slash Zach Friedman and toss a couple project bucks into the project bucket. Or head to things.com slash Zach Friedman and sign up for Hextraction Booster Packs. They give me a bigger cut. Become a lab scientist for your chance to make me read your silly name like Steve Ops, John, and Poop Town with three exclamation points. Boop, boop, boop. Mucho thanks those to our collaborators whose names I have hidden somewhere in this video. Even though, as of saying this, I haven't recorded a single frame of B-roll. <laughs> E to the I Pie, Caster the Catboy, Bitrot, Moonkin, What the Chuck, the Benevolent Misanthrope, The Suits Ruined Our Fun, Dysfunctional Potato, SXP, Schleppy the Schwagster, Turner Zay, You All Rock My Programmer Socks. Finally, the part you love to make me hate, and I say that with love. Our lab assistant supporters, Dr. Mrs. The Merman, Steven Six Foot, Six Figure, Six Pack, Schulte, Eddie, Burnett, RJ Dipcord, Stormy Design, Rusty Flute, Travis Hippa, Thunder Chicken, Zapf, Jessica Mauerhand, Sharia Coleslaw, Pussy Nuggets, Scroto Sagans, Dax Dastardly Seek, Seth, checks. Quality doggo. Here's our quality doggos. Jason, Kevin DeGraff, Bob Dobbington. I inspired the next layer's YouTube channel, so you guys check that out. Bootsy Von Poopstein, King Shaming Walrus, Kermit the OG Frog, Varka, Burn Duck 3, SKL, Cliff Henning, Dempster, Circle Zero, Roger Pigham of the Great Star Theater, Nate Vigili, Acorn, Matthew Arrington of the Curly Braces, General Buck Turgidson, the Cuttlefish. But seriously, ladies and gentlemen, cyborgs, every name I just wrote loves fake. Seriously, I'm with real subscribers. Iron Rain, Cindy Lauman, Incognito, Craft Computing, Good Lady 
Nat Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, One Sleeve, Zouch, Ortnus, Nyerb, Granville Schmidt, Danny Devoid of Life, Brian Wolf Schulte, Dennis Kempen, Juicy Legend, Drinker of Juicy Legendary Fruits, Max Lux says you're too hard on yourself, love yourself, idiot, Michael Roche, Trans Rights, VPS Data, Big Bird Tommy, What Goes Bump in the Night, The Lizards Are Watching, Zach. You know, I always took that as a warning of clandestine reptilian surveillance, but it could also mean they just really like my show. Lydia K, even Bluetooth has a right to repair. My dog is a bear. Microwave, powerful CCH, Samuel Roosh, Ryan Guler. Visit Omaha3dprints.com for all your 3D printed RPG product needs. Kirsty Wales is not Welsh, but Chechen in bed. Sticks, like the river, not the band. Bum Tickly 69, DBD, Jamie, Michael, Sir Jack Cooper, the second Wilder frying pan, the Antifa, 6A, 6F, 65, 6E75, Periclot, Socks Magox, Carnamon, not a Digimon, Cameron Ogletre, Cullen J. Webb asserts that if corporations are people, they'll all go to hell. I assert worker co ops should go to heaven. Azunda, Wielder of Iron, Heater of Shrink, Doom Crew, Inc., Zanforian, Noah B. Johnson, VK2KTJ, Nathan Johnson, Brad Cox, Nuclear 314, Topher, the three, Mazzini, Zero Unk underscore. Adam Birch, Elite Giant, Tegan at Let's Fly Tail Wheels, Aaron Steers. <coughs> That's not a patron. I just had to clear my throat. Talon Democratic Socialist and a Pretty Righteous Dude Dash Zach. Cross Threading is Just Free Loctite. Cacophony of Failure. Amanishi. Bill Schooler. Haley Kerman. Boulder Creek Yard James. Dead Beef. Measure Once Cut Twice. Reglue. Cut Again. Protagonist. Micah. I Can't Figure Out How to Change My Patreon Username. Friedman. Rinry. Quantumly Tingled. Trump Did Nothing Wrong. But His Security Guy Might. Agent Maxwell. Cody. Bob Forbes. Onyx Plague. 603. Shameless Plug for the Gaguino Espresso Project. Call Sign Carrot. Sunburnt Cat. Good Suck. Anthony Evans. Nova Ren. My Husband Watches This Shirt. So Hi. Urch, Blamo, Ashley Coleman, Mike Kelly, Home Jobs for the Handless, John Loves Jen, and a very special recognition of Isekai Elf Mahiro Chen, Dasione. They passed away a few months ago shortly after buying an annual membership, and out of respect for their survivors, I have been skipping their silly name. But the subscription is about to lapse, so for the very final time, thank you, Isekai Elf Mahiro Chen. Gome Fukuwa Onori Shimas. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope I didn't butcher that Japanese. And I hope you haven't noticed all the cement splattered on the walls. We just had like 50 feet of sewer line excavated and rebuilt. Home ownership. It's the American dream. And I would be probably dead from sewer gas inhalation without patron support. May your voids hold infinite possibilities. And I will see you in the future.